Who did you want to be before you became who you've become? Who did you want to be back at the beginning? Because I think so often our purpose is a thing that we know before we are convinced to not believe in it by the world. Welcome to We Do Hard Things, the show about facing fears, taking big risks, and chasing down dreams. On today's show, why a Hollywood executive who used to rub shoulders with Steven Spielberg and The Rock and Oprah and a whole lot more, why he quit the movie business to follow his childhood passion, and the lessons he's learned about shaping your identity, overcoming shame, and the courage it takes to brave the unknown. If you're listening to this on your phone or you happen to have your phone nearby, I want you to take it out. Now, if you have the Disney Plus app, I want you to go ahead and open that up. I'm doing that right now. At the top, you're going to see that there's a whole lot of brands, studios there. You got Disney, you got Pixar, you got Marvel and Star Wars and more. Now, imagine that you're a senior executive at the Disney company. And over the course of a decade-long run, as the studio brings on brand after brand and puts out smash hit after smash hit. Now, also imagine that you're responsible for getting all of those movies released from all of those massive studios and brands into theaters around the entire world, running for as long as possible, earning as much money as possible. That's what today's guest, Dave Hollis, did for years until one day, Despite all the accolades and the career growth and all the outward success, despite how everyone else thought that he was completely rocking it inside, inside, it felt a bit too easy. It wasn't the challenge that it used to be. Everything was just a bit too unfulfilling. I found myself in a job that was very much a dream job, first to me and then ultimately and, and maybe more importantly to the outside world where I was in it for seven years, the last seven of 17 at the Walt Disney Company. Those first three, the learning curve was steep. I had not yet built relationships that are necessary to do well in the role, whether it was filmmakers or studio executives or whatever it might need to be. And those those first three years as head of sales, I got the job at 36. Man, I was way out of my depth. And there was something invigorating and terrifying, but that also in both of those were creating growth and were creating because of the uncomfortability and the disruption, something that was helping me become a better version of myself because of not getting it right, a better version of myself because of the work I now knew I needed to do in not yet being the perfect candidate for the job that I'd been asked to do. And then somewhere along the way, right, I I was working at Disney as this distribution chief where my job Hold on. When when you say working at Disney, I... Before I got into your stuff, I'm like, he's a sales guy at Disney. So, like, I think we need to set the scene for the audience here. When we say, you know, working in sales and distribution at Disney, it sounds like a bureaucratic back office thing. No, like, you're at, like, the film festivals. You're working with directors and producers. And, I mean, you're name dropping, you know, uh, The Rock and Steven Spielberg and all of these people. Like, this is not <laughs> this is not just some sales role, right? It was truly an extraordinary job. I mean, there is nothing like sitting in a room <laughs> with a Steven Spielberg or a Rock or an Oprah Winfrey or or any of the people that I was the beneficiary of as a part of this job. And also, there was a point in time which is just so hard for I think most of us to even contemplate where after the learning curve of that first 3 years was satisfied in a sort of way that made a shorthand, a thing you could lean on with those relationships or something in having seen now the way that exhibition, those movie theater partners might react to the way you were doing things or the way that films tended to work in certain seasons of the calendar versus others. The work of making those decisions, not as difficult a decision to necessarily have to make, but that also in a world where one of the primary roles that I had was extracting maximum value for the thing that had been created as in i I, I love that corporate lingo make the most money possible (laughs) 
make the most money possible, right, is part of how I am going to be measured for having done my job well. When Disney acquired Marvel, you know, Marvel Studios, it's just one of the most storied collections of intellectual property in the history of time that then is followed up a year later by the acquisition of Lucasfilm. The way that me as head of sales negotiating with movie theater operator, hey, I need to uh, have a conversation about the price of film. And we're now talking not just about a single movie, but how Marvel and Pixar and Disney and Lucas and a distribution relationship with Steven Spielberg all come together in what it might mean to have to pay for film. That leverage, when combined with the strength of my team, when combined with the greatest leadership in the history of the studio business and the greatest intellectual properties of all time, I was getting straight A grades in a position where I wasn't having to study necessarily for those tests. And that was tough. You know, at the at the end of get out of your own way in the conclusion, and I, I don't know if you like to have your work read back to you, but you said this in Scott. Let's me, go. Right? <laughs> so many times we tend to perceive our need to change as a suggestion that we haven't been right. You've been through all the right experiences you need to get you this far and prepare you for what's ahead. But if you're going to get where you want to be, you need to allow who you are and who you were to give way to who you are going to be. And so the reason I I share that quote is because I find it so interesting that you can speak with such confidence here in this book. And yet I know how much your struggle was to walk away from Disney and to step into this idea of being a, an author and a teacher and a podcaster and the CEO of the Hollis Company and all these other things. So why didn't you think you could do it? Well, I think what's interesting is when we are comfortable, when we have a ton of ed- evidence that already exists for how we can thrive in environments that we have familiarity with or are accustomed to, Uh, The decision to leave those familiar places is definitely an act of courage. It takes courage to decide to leave a thing that you know for a thing that you need. What's interesting, though, is that when you decide to make that choice, it's not the only difficult choice that has to be made. It becomes the first of a string of difficult decisions where you have to consistently tap into courage to keep moving forward when the things that you previously depended on to give you your affirmation that, yep, you're on the right path or that it's working well or, yep, you you know are affirmed in doing what you know to do well. Uh, every time I found myself in a new situation, my insecurities were tapped and triggered. My imposter syndrome would flare. The way that I worried if I was the right person for this role because I hadn't yet developed mastery inside of it was a thing that would present. And it's supposed to present, you know, like part of what I thought was, oh, I've got a handle on wanting to fulfill something greater in this interest of fulfilling potential, right? I'd had this conversation with my kids in my back patio in the midst of my like turning 30 to 40, asking these bigger existential questions of why the heck am I on this planet and why have I not uh, been placed in a position necessarily to have to use all of my gifts. And my middle son, in the midst of a game, Ask Dad Anything, asks this very simple, like silly almost question, Dad, what are you most afraid of? And he's looking for scorpions or tarantulas and out of my mouth fell, not living up to my potential. And this like thing that was in my subconscious, now becoming conscious, I could see it and not unsee it, also had me appreciating that in real time, I was living into my greatest fear. And when you can see that, you have a choice. You can continue to live in this greatest fear that you might have. You can continue to live in a way that is disconnected from purpose or the reason why you were put on the planet, or you can decide to make change. That change was something for me that was, uh, it was life-saving in so many ways, but it also was the invitation to disruption. It was a, a choice to walk into discomfort. And that beginning of my journey in entrepreneurship was wildly different than the experience I'd come out of in corporate, in large part because when I was at Disney, the way I can best describe it, I, I had this global post 
72 countries around the world, all of them with the same mandate, get the best value for film, keep those pictures on screen for as long as you possibly can with each of those partners you're negotiating with in every country. And well, I had an appreciation for their experience. The thing I really came to appreciate after I was gone was that they had what I would describe as a nose for smoke, right? They had a depth of experience, subject matter expertise in having been in this business for so long that before problems became fires, they could sniff out smoke, apply their expertise. And I often as a leader was getting an update that was more about their having identified and preemptively put out fire than fire existing itself. In entrepreneurship, what I came to appreciate yeah, was- Yeah, you're, you're driving the fire truck, you're pulling out the hoses, you're doing it all, right? 100%, <laughs> no, like, the, like we, they're, they're, number one, I went from thousands of people to five, and ultimately we as a five person squad, we're walking inside of a part of the forest where we'd never ourselves even encountered fire. So of course had no nose for smoke. And so instead of preemptively putting out fires, we were experiencing fires at a, you know, three and five times a day frequency that that frequency left me feeling like, oh my goodness, am I ill-equipped for this role? Because I previously was in a place where preempting fires was part of my identity. And yeah. now fires as a part of what was just my every single day was becoming an identity that had me questioning if I had the capacity to do the work well. And so in, and in, that, in that moment, in that readjustment, and I think anyone who's stepping into anything new, so it's that new creative endeavor, it's that new company, it's the new business, it's starting the family, it's getting married, whatever it is, there's this idea that, that once the excitement wears off, boy, do things get real. And you start to question, you know, am I right for this? Can I do this? Do I even want this? I thought it would be easier. I thought it would happen faster. All of those things. In that moment, when you're, when you're sitting there with your team of five and you're thinking, what the hell have I done? <laughs> what did you tell yourself to get through that? Well, I mean, I want to tell you something awesome, but yeah, what I yeah. told myself was, uh, you know, the negative self-talk that you experience when you have the realization that the things that worked there don't work here, that the application of expertise and the leadership principles that had driven a 20-year career inside of a corporate environment didn't have as much direct transferable application inside of entrepreneurship as I'd convinced myself that they would. And so at the beginning, I was really facing self-doubt. I was facing the voices that pop up when you find yourself inside of something new and it starts to have you questioning if you can handle new or if you were meant to even leave the old. And I ended up like the blessing for me was finding people who themselves had had experience inside of this, you know, new environment that I was in. They'd walked the terrain. They understood the normal nature of fires and the frequency of them presenting as price of entry for doing work inside of a small business. One of the best examples I had this opportunity, I wrote about it in the new book where Rachel, my ex-wife was speaking at an event with John Maxwell. And I found myself backstage to this leadership guru bemoaning in some respects the reality of fire frequency. And he said something that was just like so simple in the like stately nature and how he addressed it. it there was a like calm and a peace to it. And he just said, hey, look, you can have consecutive good days in a row or you can run a small business, but you can't have both, right? Like the implication being that Fires are normal. Like this is, in fact, the way that running a small business works. And in the normaling or normalization of like what was happening, it gave permission for me to reframe those fires, not as some indictment of me as a leader not being prepared to handle this business, but the way that we might position these fires and the things we might learn in putting them out as what was necessary for us to understand how to actually grow and scale the business that we were intending to grow and scale. And so what I could see then, and then ultimately would see for the next 18 months in building a business was every single time a fire popped up, it was an indication, it was intel, it was information, breadcrumbs for where 
we needed a better system, a new process, better people, different product, like something that would allow us to address how we were creating something out of strengths to serve needs of people, but hadn't yet figured out how to do it well. And that permission to see those fail failures, those fires as the things that would actually afford us the visibility to where we needed to focus differently or better build something different changed everything because of course we ended up scaling something that I have so much pride for, not in spite of, but because of the way that we didn't get so many of those things right. Yeah. You know, I've, I've run a business for 15 years and there have been certain painful moments where things are so embarrassingly bad that they're almost delicious because at a certain <laughs> point, uh, you know, you, you kind of, you kind of have to, um, embrace just the stupidity of it, right? Like, like how did we let things get this bad? Or how did we not realize that that would be the, but then, but then now it's like so painful that, that it can't be ignored and that you have the opportunity to fix it. Sometimes I can get myself to that place, but, but that's not, that's not a natural state for me as, as a business person, if you know what I mean. Yeah. I can remember like one of the very, very early fires that felt so, oh, how did we do this? How did like, there was a snafu in shipping some journals that we'd created that had higher demand than we expected. And we just could not get them to the people who decided to buy them. And at the time I can remember we were sitting at our kitchen table responding one by one to frustrated customers who felt let down that they had spent their hard earned money buying something that now was not going to be delivered the way that we had promised. And it felt at the time like ugh, such a failure, but it gave way to finding a new distribution partner and finding a new system with customer service and finding a new way of creating reasonable expectation management with our community. And all of those things ended up, of course, like especially like even in just the handling of the crisis, it brought us closer to the community because of the way that we were willing to own not having done it well, to understand better how we could do it better, but also in this conversation where we have we were having with them in real time, it was like we were turning frustrated people into lifetime customers because of the experience of processing that hard thing. And I think for anyone who's running a small business or trying to do something new, you're going to make mistakes. Those mistakes are, in fact, just information that will tell you how to do it better the next time. But if you're able to see that mistake as an opportunity to build a deeper bond with the customer base or with the audience that you're trying to serve, it will definitely be that. It has been my experience over and over and over again. Okay, we are going to switch gears a little bit and talk about his new book, Built Through Courage. But to set this up, I want to share a really quick story. My wife and I, we, got, we have four kids and our really good friends, they also have four kids. All the kids are around the same age. They all play together all the time. It's awesome. But over the course of this summer, my kids kept inviting their kids over to play. And the young ones, they didn't feel like coming. For whatever reason, they kept flaking on these play dates my kids would set up. And this was starting to get my kids down because they were always really excited to have their friends over and then they'd be really disappointed when they didn't show up. And so at a certain point, I'm kind of like, <laughs> I'm the dad, right? So I'm all like, what the hell? Like, just make your kids come over and play. And then I realized our friends, the parents of these little kids who weren't coming over, they really value control. They don't like being told what to do. And so they project that on their kids and they don't really tell their kids what to do. They don't like being forced as adults. They're not gonna force their kids to come over and play. Now, I have no problem with being told what to do. People tell me what to do all the time. I have no problem with it. And so I tell my kids what to do all the time. It's just, it's just not something I value. I don't value control the same way that they do. But I realized in watching how they projected their own desires and their own fears and their own sense of control that they wanted that I also project all of that same stuff on my kids. But for me, I'm driven by fear. And so every time I see my kids step up and do something courageous and bold, something that, that I don't think I would have the courage to do, I am just so proud of. 
because as someone who's had to work on conquering my fears each and every day, I marvel at other people's courage. And so getting back to Dave's new book, Built Through Courage, as I worked through it, I couldn't help but feel like the book gave me a roadmap to being able to identify and address and work towards building courage and crushing fears and living a bigger life. But for you and for my friends who value control more and for everyone else out there, they may not value courage the same way I do. They may not look at courage in awe and wonder the way that I do. And so I had to ask Dave, why this message? Why this book? Why now? The idea that courage as a commodity is a primary necessity for you to step closer to purpose. And if there was a singular through line in the book, it's just this concept that whether it's you, Mark, me, Dave, or anyone who's listening right now, that we were designed with intention, that there was uh, not a mistake in how we are wired, how we love, how we think, how we feel, any of the experiences that we've been through, but that each of those in sum is unlike anyone who's ever been on the planet before or will ever be on the planet again. We are a limited edition, one of one, very unique bit of person. And so when you can see that, hopefully it frees you from some of the comparison that might exist. Why would you compare yourself to anyone else? You are unlike literally anyone to ever walk the planet, but that also you might consider with what I would call intentional design that we have now something of a mandate to honor the intention of a creator who put us through what we've been put through, who's given us the skills, the, the, the things that we have that are unique to us in wiring and feeling and thinking so that we might take that uniqueness and bring our gifts to light. And so the conversation in this book is, can you be really honest about where you are? It starts with self-awareness itself, starts with a radically candid conversation of how you've gotten in your own way, how you've in some ways kept yourself from listening to or trusting that instinct, that intuition, the knowing, the voice of God that lives inside of you that's been begging for you to take it seriously and pay attention to where it's trying to ask you to step into. Uh, if you can start with some radical self-awareness, you then get a chance to cast a vision for where you believe you're meant to go. What, what, like, what purpose have you actually been placed here for? What is the vision of what it looks like for you to actualize it? And then just really diving into the specifics of what it would take to get from here, a very honest assessment of what here is, to there, this mm -hmm. like recognition of uh, an intention that was placed on your life, a purpose, purpose that was placed on your life that you now can see like a movie running in your head. Great. What's it going to take? And then we dive into the habits and the routines and the circles and the way that you'd have to face your fear and reframe failure and all the things to actually make progress every single day between where you are and where you're supposed to be, where you're meant to be. Mm -hmm. I love the idea of being one of a kind and then you know, leaning in on the unique skills and abilities. But I think often people's one of a kindness comes from a place of lack. So mm -hmm. I am, I'm one of a kind. I would agree with you, but, but things must be missing or parts must be missing or my one of a kindness is just less than yours or Michael Jordan's or whoever it is that you look up to. Do, do you find that the case? I, I think you find what you look for. You know, so like your hypothesis is one that you can look to the universe, to the world, to the actions of your every day. If you go out into the world believing that lack is the thing that you are looking to have confirmed, good and bad news, you will have your hypothesis confirmed. 100% you will find evidence that supports the thing that you think. Uh, I think that it takes courage to think the opposite. And, and part of what it has required for me in this conversation around courage is to not suggest that, oh, by the way, because I believe that the world is going to open itself up to help me get closer every single day to the purpose for why I've been placed on this planet, that it means I am, uh, you know, crushing it without making mistakes or that I am not someone who is, in fact, uh, as I describe myself, very much a work in progress. Oh, no, I am three word descriptor. Dave, what are the three words to describe you? I am a work in progress. And that work in progress nature of who I am gets to hold both some of the spaces that today I am still lacking in, not in a way that is uh, admonishing me for not having already achieved what I'd hoped to, 
but that identifies these areas as the places where I want to try and invest my time, my personal development, the circle I have around me, the way my calendar hopefully suggests I will now pour into these spaces that have some need, uh, but not in a way that turns it into shame, not in a way that turns it into lack or less. And, um, and that's been the whole difference. I can hold that I am uh, here for audaciously big things and also am still quite a ways away from being in a place where I feel like I will be fully actualizing uh, all of the, the gifts that I've been given, that I will be fully out of my own way, as it were. Uh, I mean, I wrote a book on courage. Before we started the podcast, I said this out loud. Like, I wrote a book on courage. I love this book. I'm super biased in my love for it, but I also believe it to be an amazing resource for anyone who's interested in understanding what it's going to take to get closer to unlocking purpose in your life. And yet, the release of this book has really triggered unbelievable amounts of fear in my own life, has had me having to grapple. Why, why, as why is that? What, is, what does that mean? What does that mean? Yeah. Well, like, what are you afraid of? I, I, well, so like in this instance, for me, I know that I am doing the thing that I was put on the planet to do. Mm -hmm. And yet, because this thing that I am doing that I know I'm here for also happens to exist in an environment that is different than the last environment in which I released a book, I previously was married to someone who's real, real quick. Con yeah. Sorry. So, so sorry to interrupt, but real quick. When you say you're here to do what you need to do, in some context for our audience, this is being an author, being a teacher, being an entrepreneur, being a podcaster, stepping out of the corporate world. Is that what you mean? Yeah. I, so, like, I in the in like in the world of identity, I've had a handful of times in life where I had to understand or figure out who I was, who I was, or who I'd be now that I was no longer who I'd been. Right. My identity as the Disney guy was a thing that existed until it didn't. Disney Dave. Did, did, did that ever catch on? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, for sure. I mean, like at every holiday party that I went to for like decades, it, it was the thing that every person in my family was interested in having me spin a tale of some interaction with a filmmaker, my identity, my status, my proximity to some of the greatest creators in the world was part of how I was seen. And when I didn't now have that access, that title, that status, who am I? Now that I'm no longer who I've been, when I had been married for 16 years, didn't think I would get divorced. It was a big thing. I primarily identified myself the day before a conversation about divorce as uh, about divorce as husband to her. And so now that I wasn't going to be this person, now that we weren't going to be working together in a world where I thought we might work together for the rest of time. I'd been handed a blank piece of paper to attempt now to identify what my next looked like now that it was no longer what it was going to be. And one of those big questions that I had to ask was, all right, who are you going to be now that you're no longer who you were? And the thing I started with was, who did you want to be before you became who you've become? Who did you want to be back at the beginning? Because I think so often our purpose is a thing that we know before we are convinced to not believe in it by the world. And so I had to go back to the beginning. Who did I want to be before I became who I'd become? And the answer was I wanted to be a reporter. I grew up idolizing Tom Brokaw and Dan Rather. I was at 19 on an anchor desk at Pepperdine University with oversized shoulder pads. I was doing a DJ stint at 2 a.m. because I loved – Reporting. I love sitting in front of a microphone, using the gifts I have in speaking and the way that I can put together something that allows me to take any experiences I've had, but also the wisdom from other people that I respect, consolidate it, and then hopefully afford it to people in a way that gives them a chance for a breakthrough, for some insight they wouldn't have otherwise seen. And I ended up, I mean, like I had the, the most fortunate of fortunate experiences in the midst of this most recent trans transition I, as I was trying to figure out who I was going to be next, was sat on a plane next to, of all people, Dan Rather, which, as a sign of how nerdy I was growing up, was my childhood hero. Like, yeah, I didn't kiss a girl for a long time in my life, in part because I loved Dan freaking Rather as a teenager, but <laughs> that I might be sat on an airplane next to this dude in the midst of an identity crisis was, it felt like a God moment. And I had this generous two-hour conversation with this man 
who was just I'm, I'm very curious. How did you break the ice? Like I've been on a plane with beside you know people and uh, yeah. and and there's that moment where you've just been on the plane for a little bit too long to start up a conversation. You got to do it pre takeoff. I'm thinking, but how did you break that ice? <laughs> Oh, I was like unapologetically nerdy and fanboying the fact that I was sitting next to a hero. I didn't hide it. I owned it from the second I sat down and just acknowledged right up front. Like, look, I am the guy who doesn't like to talk to people on an airplane. If you are that person, I will respect it so much. But also you are who I wanted to be growing up. I have so much respect for the work that you've done. And if you want, if you, you know, do me the honor of just indulging in a little conversation, it would mean the world to me. And he was like, of course, you know, like I kept him from his newspaper for a little bit. He was, you know, he had a New York times or something on his lap and he set it to the side and was like, yep, I am so willing to sit down and have a conversation with you. And he ended up giving me two full hours of his life. And I got off that airplane And I had a knowing that now I couldn't, again, unsee that the person I believe I've been placed here to be is a reporter. I mean, fortunately fortunately for me, not of the news. I'm not interested necessarily in reporting the news, but in writing books and doing podcasts and coaching and things I do on social, I am in so many ways a reporter. And as much as it's hard to explain to my grandma Lee, who's 99, what it is that I do, if I had to pick a single word, I'm a reporter. And so getting to do this work goodness gracious, it feels like, you know, in a world where I felt like I was climbing a ladder inside of corporate, inside of media, where every rung I reached for, there was always this promise that this was going to finally be the rung, where that fulfillment I'd been hoping for, for that feeling like my gifts were fully exploited, that that finally was going to happen at the next rung. And I'd get to the next rung, And it didn't happen. And the carrot would now just move up to the next rung. And I would continue to do that work. And it wasn't until, you know, that big question from my son in the, in the, in the hot tub about, you know, my potential that I realized, man, I've actually just been climbing the wrong ladder. And I now find myself climbing a ladder and I'll be it right. Like I am at the low, low part of a ladder that I will climb for the rest of time. But I feel confident that I am climbing the right ladder for the first time in, as an adult. And that is an amazing feeling. Now, what happens, by the way, at the bottom rungs of a ladder is that you end up having fear come back at a frequency that you aren't as familiar with when you were at the top rungs of a ladder because you've already likely faced most of the things that were going to present themselves when you're you know, 15, 20 years in. I'm three years in. And there are things in real time that continue to present themselves that I did not expect. And that's where most of the learning comes from. That's where the growth will continue to come from. Regular listeners will know that I am a bit of a personality profile geek. Now, I had... Regular listeners, you guys know that I am a bit of a personality profile geek. And you'll also know that I had Benjamin Hardy, the author of Personality Isn't Permanent. I had him on the podcast and he pretty much rips to shreds in that book why these personality profiles are not scientific. They are complete BS. But but that aside, knowing that, I still dig them. And so I really tend to gravitate towards the Enneagram, which is a mystic personality system based on deep-rooted fears. And so as I'm working through the book, as I'm working through Dave's book, Built Through Courage, I'm trying to figure this guy out. I'm listening to his stories. I'm listening to his reactions and the different events. And I am trying to peg this guy. I'm trying to, I'm trying to work out what Enneagram profile is yet. Do you guys ever do that with your friends? You ever try to figure out who they are? Now, Dave made it easy for me because at a certain point in his book, he just comes out and says he's an Enneagram 3, which is known as the achiever. Now, achievers are people whose deepest fear is that if they stop achieving, they stop hitting those goals, They stop being everything to everyone else that they want them to be, that people won't love them for the real version of them. That people only love achievers for the achievements, for the things that they do and can achieve. But but if they got to know the real version of them, not the version of them that everyone else wants, that they won't love them. That is, that's heavy. That's heavy stuff. Now, more interesting to me, though, is that threes, the achievers, they're part of a, of a grouping that are driven by shame. Some people, some groupings are driven by fear. Hey there, 
Here's Mark. Some people are driven by anger, but Dave is a number three, is an achiever, is driven by shame. And so it's not at all surprising to me that as I'm working through this book, it's just, just the, the keyword shame just keeps coming up time and time again. He, like in this interview, he mentions shame time and time again. And so listeners, buckle up <laughs> because for the next few moments, we're going to go deep on the Enneagram. And honestly, it's a lot of fun. Well, what's crazy, so I, I have, as a part of this launch team around Built Through Courage, I've been doing uh, one winner a week, one hour conversations with people who have been active in the community. And I had a call yesterday with this person in the community named Crystal. She is working as someone who is going to be an Enneagram coach. And she said something to me that actually has turned Every single thing I think about Enneagram and my threeness on its head, which is Ooh, okay. wild. I can't, I can't wait to hear and it. And that is um, thinking a little bit about what your intended or hoped for outcome is versus why you like or, or how you identify yourself. I'm not I'm butchering the elegance with which she had this conversation, but my my hoped for uh, you know outcome is love. Right. Like, uh, you know, my achievement in so many ways is a reflection of thinking that if I can achieve, then I will be loved. I will be seen as worthy. I will be seen as enough. I understand intellectually that I am already lovable, that I am already enough, that I am worthy before I achieve a certain thing. And yet, because of my programming, circumstances of life growing up, whatever else, I have this relationship between achievement and love. And so good news. I, I memorized all the Bible verses. I became valedictorian of my high school. I got good jobs, you know, throughout my career. And uh, none of it, to be honest, like changed my lovability, even though it was part of what drove me. And the interesting thing about the question was like, Dave, is there a chance that you are not a three, but that oh. you are potentially a uh, two or, or potentially someone who's interested in, in love. Oh, a two is and, a helper. So that's people who feel the need to be needed. Yeah. Was it two or four? The, four I, now, is now the, okay. Well, four is the, um, is, uh, the romantic and that's the person who desperately just wants to belong and fit in. And yet they, uh, they also want to be completely unique and that, and that tension of just wanting to belong yeah. Okay. and, yeah, and yeah, be yeah. a part of something and yet stand out is, is very, very hard and painful for them. I think the bottom line ends up being as much as when I'm answering a test in a personality diagnostic, I can identify the actions that I've taken in my life, right? I have done a lot of achieving and I understand the catalyst for the achievement but I don't know, after this single conversation, if my answering the questions and the way that I've answered them is a reflection of my personality rather than it being something that I've done because of a desired outcome. <laughs> And so now yeah, you're, I just have to that, take a that's step. Not a, that's not a, a two back. line of thought, just so you know. So, uh, you know, <laughs> like, I, I don't think a two would ever even ask that question. So, so there you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Uh, so I, the, the, the bottom line is, I don't know. I don't know anything about anything. I do know I reference in the book that I, in my first book, I recognized having taken the test in the midst of stress that I was a nine. And yes. when a three in stress takes the test, they actually show up as a nine, which is a peacekeeper. And so I boldly declared in my first book, I'm a nine, I'm a peacekeeper. This is the role that I have. And what was wild is in this most recent book, I was like, here's the danger in personality diagnostics. I took the test under stress. It told me I was a certain thing because it was coming from this third party that had some authority. I believed it to be true and found myself then acting as the thing I had been diagnosed as, even if it was in Con it was it, it was in it was in conflict with, with your true yeah yeah with my so, true self which is wild well so threes move to nine in times of stress the peacekeeper and they move to six the loyalist in times of health and so that's why there's a lot of overlap but but we won't we won't get too in deep into that but, but I, I love your I, nerdy I, like this though this is good mark <laughs> I, I like oh this. I, I am well so the reason I was kind of taking us this way and asking about shame is because often. Uh, often a, a lot of our self-judgment shows up as shame. Now, my wife is, you know, works through shame. I don't, I don't 
feel shame. I feel guilt. Uh, I feel uh, fear. I feel uh, worry. I feel anxiety. I don't feel shame. <laughs> like that's not something I work through. And but but so many people do. And so, how do you stop from looking inward and beating yourself up for all the things that you aren't as you move towards the things that you're going to become? What's interesting is I, I made this like really bold declaration at the end of 2019 that 2020 was going to be my best year ever. I may have actually brought some of the things that we've universally experienced to bear because of that bold declaration. And I do apologize, but, uh, I'd say, what does that mean? What does that mean? I'm just saying I manifested this best year ever in what ended up also being for a lot of us, our hardest year ever. What I, what yeah. I didn't appreciate when I said, Hey, I'm going to have my best year ever in 2020, saved it for, for my 45th year on the planet. I didn't realize I didn't get a say in the conditions through which my best would come forward. And in so many ways, I became my best through the hardest things I've ever had to experience. But that is not the point of bringing it up. When I decided to, uh, yep, try and engineer my best year ever, I actually took a couple of days away from life, sat on a rock with a lined notebook in uh, a little space outside of Tucson, Arizona. And I tried to understand where I had previously not been my best so that if there was an ingredient, a variable that had been present consistently over time, that I might be able to preemptively stop that thing from happening in my desire for my best. And it's, of course, it turned out there was something that was present over and over again when my not best, the way that I didn't love myself when I was by myself or whatever it might be, had existed in my times of feeling stuck or funk. The, the thing was that there was a, a knowing that I had for who I'd need to be today to become the person that I know I can be or that I've been placed on the planet to become. And that if I, in controlling the only thing that I have control over, the way I show up in the next 24 hours, created integrity between this, the version of who I need to be today to become this person that I am on a path to becoming, I felt great about myself. But when I didn't create integrity, when there was dissonance, incongruence between this version of who I know I need to be to become, who I'm meant to be, and who I showed up today, this 24-hour window where I can control only the things that happen in this day, that space was where my shame lived. That space was where my shame or my lack of confidence or my self-loathing or my lack of motivation or whatever it is that pulls me down or holds me back lives. And so in a crazy way, when I now experience shame, one, I know that shame is not going to serve me getting to where I want to go, even for one minute. It doesn't serve me at all. But it is as a part of me that I am the observer of trying to draw attention to the dissonance. It is trying to play a role that says, hey, Dave, you and I both know that there is a version of who you were created to be to become who you were intended to become. And I exist not to make you feel like crap. I exist as information to draw your focus to where there's currently dissonance between how you're showing up and who you ought to be or could be showing up as given all the gifts that God has given you to become the light bearer that you were put on this planet to be. And so I've tried to change the relationship that I have with shame from something that I hate or that provokes hating myself into it simply just being a part that is a messenger with a, with a message that is trying to draw my attention and focus to where that dissonance exists so that I can do the single thing that I attempt to do every single day. Just close that gap. I am trying to close the gap between how I show up that doesn't serve who I'm meant to be and how I might create integrity and I asked that question, like the big question that I've been asking is like, how do I feel about myself when I'm by myself? And the answer is, man, when I create integrity with who I know I'm here to be and how I've used the last 24 hours to create as much integrity between that person and the actions of my day, the thing I can control, I feel awesome. And so I am trying to get back to that state of awesome. I'm trying to get back to that state of feeling like, oh man, you did it, brother. 
You successfully used the tools you were given. You successfully conjured the courage that was necessarily necessary. You, you successfully beat back the fear, the you know imposter syndrome, the insecurities, and you showed up. You showed up the way that we know that you can. Fantastic. You are a step closer to fully unlocking the purpose of your life. Let's go. And that's the mission, closing that gap. That is super cool. You know, I can't, I can't help but you know, draw on a callback when we were talking about putting out fires as the entrepreneur, as a CEO, I said, you know, when things are bad enough, it's almost, you know, delicious because, because you can not help avoid it. I've never thought of taking these other signals, the shame, the, the fear, the doubt in the same way, like that, that this is, that this is life. This is God. This is the universe. This is circumstance, whatever it is, just raising a flag and say, Hey, pay attention over here. And, there was one thing that you had mentioned in the book that I had to stop. I, just, I had to stop listening um, because I listened to I listened to your reading, which which was fantastic, by the way. But um, I had you. to stop because it it kind of floored me. Um, and so to take a step back, you know, I haven't really gotten into meditation as much as I should or yet. But there's this concept or this idea, I believe. I, I'm only I've only heard this in meditation, where as your thoughts come to you. Often we think that our thoughts and our feelings and our emotions are things that are happening in real time, but there's this idea that you can actually watch, you can acknowledge this thought or this feeling or emotion, you could watch it go by and you could choose to pick it up or not pick it up. You could choose to accept it or not accept it. And I was like, I love that. Now, in your book, you also mentioned this idea that that there are these slices or, or parts of your personality, and I often think that those personality parts are core to me. You know, I didn't win in this area. That means I'm not good. You know, it's, it's a very fixed mindset point of view. But, yeah. but in your book, and, and you explain it way better than I am right now, but you explain that, you're, that your therapist helps you acknowledge that, that there could be these parts of you that are not the core version of you. Can you, can you explain that and share that? I mean, I think, yes. Well, number one, this has been like some of the most transformative work that I have ever done. I've gone to therapy for years and years and years, but when uh, this primary pillar of my identity, husband to her, was now gone, I needed to find myself and decided to do some exclusive work inside of and around the conversation of self. And so I found this practice called Internal Family Systems, which is in like the simplest way. If you saw the movie Inside Out, this might sound somewhat familiar that like you or if you've read the book Untethered Soul, I mean, like, it is such a compliment to the work. But you are self, and these thoughts and these feelings, they are parts, they are helpers, they are not you, but they are parts of you. And they are there believing themselves to be present to either protect you or help you in some way, even the negative things, the negative emotions, the negative thoughts, the negative coping mechanisms, they are there unaware of the fact that they are negative. They only are there because they believe themselves to be playing the role that they are there to play. And if you can separate yourself from them, right? And the, 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 the one that I give a great example of, because it has been so helpful for me, is that of anxiety, right? When I have previously in my life become anxious, I just tend to think that I, Dave, am anxious. And what I have through the work been able to do is now be an observer of my anxiety. I've even named it. My anxiety's name is Clark. And I now, when I am presented with anxiety, and this is, you know, I'm not saying like clinically diagnosed anxiety disorder. I'm saying like situational anxiety presents itself when life starts to go sideways. I become anxious and I now get to have a conversation with anxiety, which I have named Clark. And I get to ask, hey, Clark, what's up? Why are you here? What role do you believe yourself to be playing? And I now, in engaging in a conversation that has me as the observer of this emotion and in a conversation with this emotion, am able to understand what role he believes himself to be playing. And Clark, bless his sweetheart, though I don't love the idea of feeling anxiety, is almost every single time presenting himself because of a place in my life where ambiguity exists, 
that if he were able to effectively direct my attention to that ambiguity and I were able to create something of a plan to make it less ambiguous, he would feel like his job has been satisfied. He now gets to say goodbye and good night. And I now, in having a plan, get to feel the thing that you feel when you are not anxious because a plan in so many ways is an antidote to anxiety. And so in a bizarre way, it's changed the way that I have a loathing for a feeling like anxiety into something of almost gratitude for the way that he, as an intel officer, is just bringing information my way to say, hello, Dave, there's ambiguity over here, brother. If you could just draw your attention to this ambiguous place, put a little bit of detailed plan against it, I will leave you alone and my job here will be done. I feel like as the helper, I have a responsibility to help you create something of certainty in ambiguous spaces. And it's helped. If you've had a chance to see the cover of Dave's book, you'll notice that it has what looks like what looks like waves, like an overhead view of waves on the ocean. And that's because this book is built completely around a nautical theme. <laughs> I don't know why I said it like that, but and, and so at the start of the book though, Dave mentions this this quote from John Shedd, a ship in harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. And so this line, this quote that he's actually tattooed on his body, he, he's, he's taken so far as he's built his entire book around it, around this idea of this nautical theme. Now, between you and I, it does not bother me at all. I actually think it helps illustrate a lot of the points that he's trying to make. But I, I had to ask, I had to ask, what's, I, I feel like Seinfeld right now, but what's the deal, <laughs> Dave? What's the deal with all the boats, man? I mean, if you get nauseous at sea, there's a chance that the number of nautical references in this book will make you nauseous as, at well, as well. Uh, here's the thing. I'm not good on boats. I'm not interested necessarily in even going out on the water. If I, like, I can remember days back at Disney time where it was like, all right, the senior retreat has us going on a ship to celebrate the Pirates of the Caribbean release. And I was like, I'm going to be the guy standing on this dock waving at y'all having a dance party <laughs> on a ship. Um, but here's the, like, the reality is, you know, I, I got this tattoo uh, on my forearm. It has been this mantra of mine for the last four or five years where either I chose change or change chose me. And I, I you know, like I so appreciate the way that this as a thing has helped me remember that the things I need in life, the life that I'm looking for, the proximity to purpose, all of it exists outside of my comfort zone beyond a safe harbor that I am familiar with, where in the choppiness of the waters that exist beyond that harbor, I might actually have the benefit of growth. I might actually have the benefit of becoming who I'm placed on this planet to be. And the tattoo more than anything, it's a, a John Shedd quote, it says, a ship in harbor is safe. That's not what ships are built for, but that's not what ships are built for. Um, it's this reminder that I was built for this, right? That I was built to handle the choppy waters that live beyond my safe harbor. And if you as a listener are interested in the full pursuit of purpose in life, it's only going to come when you decide that you also were built to handle the choppy waters that will live outside of the harbor that you've currently found yourself docked to or connected to. And so, uh, you know, it, it doesn't make it easy necessarily, right? Like finding a way to create something of equilibrium in the shaky, unmoored uh, nature of that uh, choppy water is part of uh, what makes it uh, terrifying and exhilarating, but um, it is where you ultimately become who you were meant to be. Um, when I had that as like the the lead thing in my life, my mantra, as it were, I just took it and ran with it because the analogy of the harbor and those choppy waters, the way that getting your kind of sea legs or becoming the captain of your own ship started resonating. Um, I just <laughs> went with it. At first, I, I was a little bit like, Okay, Dave, cool. We're going to really run with this. Then um, <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. And, and there were a few points. First, the idea that you have to leave sight of shore before you can see the next destination. 
you you go into that in your book, but even just the visual, the idea of like so many times we want to step out from what we're doing to the next thing and just just kind of like hop, like right, like you just want to mind the gap, you want to hop, you want to you want to make it there, but you, you gotta you gotta leave harbor, you gotta leave shore, you gotta hit that middle of the ocean before you even start to see the next destination. The idea that staying in harbor doesn't isn't necessarily safe, and I think I think the quote was. Um, you can fail doing what you don't love, so you might as well take a chance doing what you do love. You, you, I don't want to fawn over you. you. You did a great job writing the book, man. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. I, you know, like there, there is something, the allure of the harbor or, or, or the way that we deify the thing that we know. Uh, you know, there, there is something in comfort. There is something in the status quo that has us believing irrationally that what is will be. And so often we end up justifying staying where we are because of what we believe to be a predictability of what exists always existing. And that is, it's dangerous because one day change will choose you. The things that, uh, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, I mean, the thing is there are so many things that I wish hadn't happened that have of course become the reason why I have become the person I've become, that I have wild gratitude for not getting my way in so many things in the last 18 months because they were precisely the things that I needed to have happen. But if you are someone who's like, you know what, I'm just going to hunker on down, keep the boat tied to the dock as it were, um, that's fine unless a, you know, a hurricane comes through port. You know, unless a diagnosis or a job loss or a relationship ending or something shows up, in which case uh, you may have at the expense of being someone who has an agency and opportunity to create their next, find yourself scrambling to figure out what next looks like when uh, that allure of what is and you know what is will be ends up rug pulling <laughs> you in real time. For sure. La last question for you. So we started off the conversation talking about at Disney, the fact that you could achieve and yet things felt like it came a bit too easy. You know, you have, you have Marvel and you have, uh, you know, Lucas and you have Pixar and you just, you have, you're backed by all of the things, all of the things, and you have luck on your side and all, all of that. If we mirror that to today, sure, things are harder. You're three years in, but you were three years into your career when things started to become a little bit easier. So let's give you five. Let's give you seven years. Let's give you a little more time to figure this out. Do you worry or fear that you won't find yourself outgrowing this? That things will oh, become too I hope easy? I, I, I better outgrow this. I, I'm 46. You, you know, I mean, it's like... You say that like it's old. I, I hope it's not old. <laughs> oh, no. I'm not, I don't think it's old at all. I've got 50 good ones ahead of me and four okay ones after that. Like, I, th we, we, there's a lot of life left. I better outgrow this. Uh, you know, like, I'm just starting doing this work and the things that are pushing me up against my comfort zone today, they better be things that I have a degree of comfort with a year from now or two years from now. And when that happens, it means I have to start thinking differently, bigger, you know, how can I uh, either have a, a, a bigger, broader platform or, or find myself working in arenas that are different. And I don't mean like public arenas. I mean like, all right, can I take this set of skills or these tools and bring them into something that is completely foreign and unfamiliar to me to see how the gifts might themselves be best used inside of this new space. But I, you know, I, if anyone is listening and they're like, you know what, I'm good just being good. I'm okay being okay. I just, I want to encourage you to believe that there is something richer and more fulfilling that might exist for you. How you feel about yourself when you're by yourself is that question I keep asking. And when I feel like, oh, I had something that was feeling good, but not great. And I pushed myself to go into a new space that was uncomfortable, but took good to great. I know I'm, again, taking some agency in life to manufacture that kind of feeling. And if that great ever slips into good because of it having become comfortable, because of it having become too, too easy, I have a responsibility, a mandate because of how I want to feel about myself when I'm by myself 
to push toward the thing that I have fear for to see how walking toward it is going to challenge me and change me. I, what's weird is I'm not a huge fan of fear, and I've always been very fearful. And for a lot of my life, I tried to mute fear, avoid fear, stay away from fear. I was very fixed mindset oriented in a lot of ways. Um, but in that, I tended to stay in spaces where I knew I could succeed, and that came at the expense of growth. Now, especially in a world where so many things that I thought I had control over turned out to be uncontrollable, for the good, by the way, um, I have come to see fear as an invitation. When I start to get scared about something, more often than not today, my reaction is, ah, oh, crap, I guess we got to go do this thing now, too. <laughs> I guess, I guess we got to go do this thing now too, which, you know, like is hard, but it's also like, it just is, you know, and the, the more that you can see fear as an invitation, the more that you're going to hopefully continue to push yourself out of comfort into something that feels like growth because not to, and I don't want to be hyperbolic, I don't want to be dramatic, but you are either growing or dying. And anytime I found myself stuck, it was because I'd stopped growing and found myself in a season of death, in a season of de-evolving rather than evolving. And I want to just keep on growing, keep becoming this person I know I've been placed here to be. And every single time, it's going to be about walking toward my fear. Connecting with Dave and working through his book actually helped me unlock some big roadblocks in my own life. So thank you, Dave. Okay, three key takeaways from this conversation. Number one, sometimes stuff going wrong, it's less about you. It's just more about the role that you're in. So listen to the advice John Maxwell gave Dave when he said, you can have consecutive good days in a row or you can run a small business. Just know if you're feeling that grind, the grind that comes from back-to-back -back bad days, it's just a part of the process. It has nothing to do with you. Number two, understand that you are a work in progress. Doesn't mean that you're not built for more, but Dave spoke to the fact that he's able to forgive himself when things go wrong because he, like you, like me, like everyone else, we may have big dreams, we may have audaciously large goals, but we are all a work in progress. And number three, you cannot, cannot, cannot stand still. Often, we justify staying where we are because we somehow believe that there's something safe and predictable about our current situation. We also think that if it exists today, it will always be there. And that is a dangerous place to be because one day, whether you choose it or not, change will come. Change will choose you even if you do not choose it. Now, if you are ready for more, if you are ready for change, that big dream, those high hopes, the next breakthrough, you are going to need courage. And that only comes from facing the hard things in your life. It's not easy. It's never easy. But remember, we, we're not just dreamers, we're doers because we do hard things. You have got to hear the conversation I had with the motivational legend, Les Brown. We dig into the toughest moments of his life. And honestly, we go places I have never heard Les talk about. Click on the video right over there to hear this real inspiring story.